I'm gonna patent it. It's my word of the month. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I think yesterday we got a very good question from uh, Sohaib. Smile, Sohaib, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Sohaib, come. So, uh, this is the, the question of the month. Very good question. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. So uh, today, inshallah, we got all the uh, questions written here. And Hussein is going to help me read the questions. He's going to read them out loud. So hopefully this will bring some peace and quietness to the discussion, inshallah. Okay. Loud. Why do you fast in Ramadan? Okay. Good question. Good question. So we fast in Ramadan because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so in the Quran. And the Prophet says so in the Hadith. So in the Quran it says in Surah Baqarah, Shahu Ramadan Alladhi unzila fi Quran. And in the middle of the ayah it says, Faman shahida minkum ashahra fal yasum. Whoever is there, healthy, not traveling, able to fast, let them fast. And the Prophet says, The month of Ramadan has come, let those who are able to fast, fast. So it's one, it's one of the five pillars of Islam. I, I know my question isn't there, but uh, um, were Muslims the first ones to come up with the lunar calendar? Well, the lunar calendar was used for hundreds, probably thousands of years before the time of the Prophet Sallallahu So even the Arabs, they, uh, they use the same month, uh, Jumada and, uh, and all these different months, and they have meanings in Arabic. So for example, Ramadan, because a lot of times it came in the summertime, and it was very hot, so Ramadan comes from the root word Ramada, which means to be very, very hot, heat, right? And so on and so forth. Jumada comes uh, normally around winter time, but when it does come, because it rotates with the regular months, but when it comes, it comes, the nights are very cold from Jumada, like freeze, uh, with the jamid, frozen. So this is why they chose the names of the month. But the names were used, and the lunar calendar was used way before the time of the Prophet Sasa. Next question. Hassan. Why do you wear? Your clothes. <laughs> Just wear your clothes. And for the wife, if her husband dies, I think it is not nice if she goes out with colorful clothes, you know, and. Uh, like yellow or red and, and all these things. She has to show like grief for the husband. It doesn't have to be black, blue, brown or something, but colorful clothes are, should be avoided at this time. You know, but there's not a certain uh, color of grief in Islam. Like if you wear white, blue, dark blue, black, it's up to you. If you have taken a shower, do you have to still do wudu? Another good question. So if someone takes a shower like on Friday or any other time, uh, you don't have to make wudu after because you already covered everything. Uh, the way the Prophet ﷺ did his uh, shower, he made wudu first. He washed his hands, nose, everything first. Then he would take a shower. But say for example, you took a shower, you forgot to make wudu at the beginning, it is not a big deal because everything is washed already. So you don't have to make wudu at the end. And this is the answer of some of the Sahaba, by the way, like Abdullah ibn Umar al He said the same thing. Next one. If you talk bad about someone in your mind, is it backbiting? Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't say if you talk. 
if you have evil thoughts uh, about someone, uh, the most important thing, <clears throat> because sometimes, let's face the reality, sometimes people hurt you. And people, you know, do horrible things to us. So if these evil thoughts cross your mind, I think we're human beings, and, and if they cross your mind, khalas, it's not a big deal. But you shouldn't say them out loud. Unless, for example, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, لَا يُحِبُّ اللَّهُ الْجَهْرَ بِالسُوءِ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ إِلَّا مَنْ ظُلِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like evil thoughts to be voiced out loud in front of people, except for those who have been wronged. Say, for example, someone uh, hit your car, or someone stole your money, or someone punched you in the face. You can report it to the teacher. This is not backbiting. Or if someone stole your car, uh, someone will say, okay, I'm not going to report it to the police because this will be backbiting. No, it is not backbiting. You're reporting it to the police so they can correct the wrong. If someone is proposing to your sister in marriage, and you ask someone, like a friend of this, that guy who's proposing, what do you think of this guy? And if they tell you he's a bad guy, he doesn't pray, he's not a good guy, this is not backbiting because you are telling the truth. You're not lying, right? But if he's a good guy, he goes to the masjid, he prays, he's a decent person, and you say they are not good, this is a lie. And if the person is evil and you say they are good, this is a lie, right? So evil thoughts that overwhelm you or cross your mind, there is nothing wrong. You have to try to keep yourself away from all these evil thoughts. But sometimes if you are overwhelmed with the thought, at least don't let it come out unless uh, you have been abused or wronged in a certain way to seek counseling or assistance from the authorities, then there's nothing wrong in this case. Allah Next one. How can you take out a jinn on somebody's soul? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> some of the uh, shiyu who are specialized in this field, I'm not one of them, uh, they read certain ayat from the Quran and certain, they say certain dua and the jinn will come out. Uh, again, my, my answer is always don't overwhelm yourself with, with all these thoughts about jinn, about, you know, they exist. What we know about them is what we read in the Quran, like Surah Jinn, at the end of Surah Ahtaf, that there are believers among them, disbelievers, there are good jinn, evil jinn, and what exists in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu there are good ones and bad ones. But how do they look like? Do they have horns, big, red, eyes, do they have a, like a fork, a tail? We don't know. We don't know. So we leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That much we know. But beyond that, we have no clue. If someone's blind, how can they fast or pray to Allah? Well, if someone is blind, it, it doesn't affect their ability to fast. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it doesn't stop you from succeeding. We have a sister in the community with ability, disability. Uh, her name is Sister Rabia Khidr. And she has been appointed as a, uh, to the Human Rights uh, Committee here in, in, uh, in the region. Uh, she's very successful. Alhamdulillah, she's serving the community. Uh, she's helping many communities. So disability does not stop her from helping those who are around her. Does it stop her from fasting, praying? No, not really. But if the question is about knowing the time to make salah or to start, start your fast and end your fast, there are so many uh, techniques, phone apps. They live with someone in the same house who can give them a bit of uh, guidance, inshallah. And Allah will give them the reward for their patience and the challenges they face. Is interest only with money? What do you mean? Like riba? Yeah. Okay. So the brother is asking about riba. Well, <clears throat> there are two types of riba in, mentioned in the Quran and also in the Hadith. Uh, riba al-ziyada wa riba al-nasi. Uh, ziyada basically, if you ask someone, can I borrow a thousand dollars because they are in debt. They need money, desperately. So you tell them, I'm going to give you uh, one thousand dollars today and Tomorrow, in two days, in a week, I'm going to take the money back from you, $1,200. So 
So they borrow the money, but they pay it back with uh, an increase. Uh, and there is no humanity in this from an Islamic point of view. Because you know that your brother is in a desperate need. And they are struggling to make the ends meet. And they need to pay their bills or pay off their debts. And you make it more difficult for them by putting more money on their backs. Most of the time, people will do the same thing and they borrow from the bank. They borrow the money. They have to pay 20%, 15%, Allah Alam. There is also compound interest. And the bank make, makes it very difficult for you to pay on time. Then you end up with foreclosure, you sit your house, uh, you lose money, and maybe you'll end up in jail. There is no humanity in this. Uh, the second type is when you borrow someone, uh, some money from someone, uh, or you take money, you want to start a business, for example. Uh, he's not your partner. You're just borrowing the money from them. So the person will tell you, uh, take the 10000 If you pay after six months, you're going to pay me 15000 If you pay after a year, you pay me 20000 So this is riba nasiha. You pay more money for the delay. Right? So this is not acceptable. Uh, the humane way of helping people who are in debt is mentioned in Surah Baqarah. وَإِنْ كَانَ ذُو عُسْرَةٍ فَنَظِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٍ وَأَنْ تَصَدَّقُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if someone is in debt and they are not able to pay, then give them more time so they can be able to pay. And if they are not able to pay uh, in time after you gave them a grace period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maybe you should consider dropping some of the amount as part of your zakat. So if they owe you 10,000, maybe you drop 1,000 or 2,000 from your zakah to help the person. So you give them more time, you drop some of the money as zakah or sadaqah to help them out. And I think this is the humanity of Islam compared to the inhumanity of the materialistic uh, systems out there in the world. We'll take two more questions. What other signs of judgment Well, we know from reading the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, that there are two types of signs. Of course, you probably heard of hadith Jibreel when he came to ask the Prophet ﷺ about Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and at the end he uh, asked about the signs and the Prophet ﷺ gave him some signs. Uh, so there are major signs and minor signs. The major, some of the minor signs include, for example, uh, people are lying and people are cheating and if you watch if you watch the news or you watch uh, political debates like the ones for example between Hillary and Trump uh, there's uh, some websites that provide fact checking so uh, fact checking so Trump lied uh, once every 30 seconds Every 30 seconds he made a lot on in national TV, right? But still he won the election. And the Prophet ﷺ said, before the end of time, the liars will be believed and people who tell the truth, they will be called liars. And the people who are honest will be distrusted or mistrusted, and so on and so forth. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that one of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment, uh, before the Day of Judgment comes, a lot of people will be killed. People will be killed in the millions. And he said, those who are being killed, they, they will not know for what reason they are being killed. And those who are shooting, they don't know why they are, get, they are killing these people. This is the madness before the end of time. And, and so on and so forth. And uh, so these are some of the minor signs. One of the minor signs mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the people who used to be shepherds in the desert, they will be competing with one another on who builds the tallest building. Who is building the highest towers in the world? In Dubai, Saudi, uh, here, there. And in another narration of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about these people, who are they? Who are these people that will be competing to build the tallest building, the highest skyscraper? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Arab, the Arabs, will be doing it. It's mentioned in an authentic hadith. So I'm not trying to look down on any nationality or anything, but I'm just telling you that these are some of the, uh, some of the times.
Then the major signs include the coming of the Dajjal, the coming of Isa alayhi uh, salam. There will be a lot of earthquakes and landslides and, and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, so these are the signs. We have seen, I would say with confidence, that we have seen most of the minor signs, if not all of them. Uh, the ulama listed around 120 of them. If you get some books that talk about the signs of the Day of Judgment, we have probably seen almost all of the minor signs, the major ones, not yet. But as soon as one of them comes, all of them will be there. It's like the prayer beads, the lisibha, so once it's broken, so all the beads will be on the floor, all at the same time. Wallahu alam. So, one thing I want to say in conclusion to the answer, that you shouldn't busy yourself by looking uh, for the signs of the Day of Judgment. When will the, say of, the Day of Judgment come? Because when the Prophet ﷺ was presented with the question, when will the Day of Judgment come? And the Prophet ﷺ would say, Mada talaha? What have you done to prepare for this day? He said, don't look for the signs, just be a good person. Pray, fast, be kind, be good, generous to everyone, be a nice person, and khalas. You have done your part. Whether it comes today, tomorrow, next year, tell us it's in the hands of Allah. Allah We'll take one last question and we'll let them go. Um, From the written one. How can an inmate be an imam? What? Uh, I think this is a follow up on the talk by Imam Ibrahim Dawni last year. And actually, have seen several inmates, several inmates. Uh, who became imams or chaplains. Uh, Suhaib Whip, for one, is very popular. He's one of the speakers at the RAS. Very popular imam, mashallah. He went to Al-Azhar, he memorized Quran, he speaks Arabic fluently now. Uh, he was, he's an American and he went to jail, I think when he was 16 or 17. He was a gang member. Then eventually he came out and he went to Al-Azhar. He got, I think, a master's degree in Islamic studies. He is one of the finest uh, imams in the world now, in, in the field of da'wah. Uh, you heard of Malcolm X, he was also in jail, Ibrahim Dawni and some other imams. In Islam, and uh, I want you to keep this in mind. What matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not how you start your life. What matters to him is how you finish at the finish line, right? So again, what matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not how you start, it's how you finish. Because many of us, when we are young, we do foolish things, irresponsible things, but as we grow older, we slow down and we, we start to think and to, uh, to do things wisely. And this is the case for some of the Imams. Some of them started, they had rough childhoods, they had broken families, problems, so on and so forth. But eventually they were able to transcend all these problems and challenges and they became successful. And uh, we don't look down upon them, we look up to them because they should be an inspiration to all of us. Because they didn't have some of the basic things that we take for granted now. Good family, uh, caring teachers, a house to live in and a lot of things that we have. They didn't have most of these things, so they didn't have guidance. We do, right? So Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair and we'll see you next week inshallah. Uh, try to uh, motivate your family to attend the Anatolia Islamic or Anatolia Motivation Conference, November 26. It's going to be from 12 p.m. till uh, 9 p.m. We got some some of the finest speakers in Canada inshallah. Jazakumullah khair and assalamu alaikum. Don't forget to subscribe. Assalamu alaikum. Please.